Ki ora tato katoa, kua karapirepine mai nei i tenei wā, ki a ino i tato. Whakataka te hō ki te uru, whakataka te hō ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai. E hi ake anā te atakura, ke tio, he huka, he hō hū ti hei maoriora. Ko te mihi tua tahi ki te runga rawa, nā 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 mea katoa i hunga. Ko te mea tua rua, ka mihi ki te kingi Māori tu hei tia pota to te whero whero te tauwhutu. Tia noa ki te kāhui āri ki nui tonu, rire rire hou po Māori e. Ko te mea tua toru ki nga tīni mate, haere ki te pō nui, ki te pō roa, haere, haere, haere atura, mo e mā rā katoa. A piti hono, tāta i hono, te hunga mate ki te hunga mate. A piti hono, tāta i hono, te hunga ora ki a tato, tēna tato katoa. Ko gučevo te maunga, ko žeravija te ava, ko tarara te vivi, to Srbija te hapu, ko livera ka vinarac to kuinjoa. No reira, tēna koto, tēna koto, tēna tato katoa. Noi mai, haere mai. Hello everyone and very well welcome to the Early Years Research Center seminar organized by the Wilf Malcolm Institute of Educational Research at University of Aikato. Uh, my name is Olivera Kamenarac. I am senior lecturer in the Division of Education and also co-director of Early Years Research Center. I'm very pleased to host this seminar and see so many of you today. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, before we introduce our two brilliant speakers, Professor uh, Linda Harrison and Professor Sandy Wong, I would like just to uh, mention a couple of house uh, hipping rules. Uh, the seminar will be recorded, and um, for that reason, please keep yourself on mute during the presentation. You would, if you would like to ask any questions um, during the presentation and open any kind of question to discussion uh, after the presentation, please uh, please type your questions in the chat uh, box. Uh, so I would invite Professor Linda Mitchell to introduce our uh, two lovely speakers. And uh, thank you so much, Linda. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, tēnā kōrua, Linda and Sandy. I'm really a very warm welcome to you both. I'm really pleased to be introducing you for this seminar. I think the Early Years Research Centre members have had an especially collaborative, friendly, productive relationships with both of you and with your colleagues that goes back over actually more than a decade um, for when you were working at Charles Sturt University in Bathurst. And we've held reciprocal visits over the years with taken part in research collaborations, presentations, publishing ventures, and the topics have been really diverse, infant and toddler, care and education, belonging and continuity, integrated early childhood provision, and a few of us even dabbled in your time use <laughs> diaries that you're going to be talking about today. Um, we didn't get as far as you got in relation to our research with that, but it was very um, amazing to do it. So Linda Harrison is a prof professorial research fellow in early childhood education at Macquarie University. She's adjunct professor of early childhood education at Charles Sturt University. And Linda's research is really highly regarded, um, I think, for the use of mixed methods, um, methodologies, and really innovative methodologies as well, at looking at current issues in early childhood education and care settings. And I think your research, Linda, has really influenced policy and pedagogy, not only in Australia, but worldwide and definitely in New Zealand as well. So Linda has led investigations of children's experiences of early childhood education and childcare. We don't tend to use that word now in New Zealand, childcare, teacher-child relationships, systems, structures and processes that support high quality education and care 
and the early childhood workforce and the impact of early childhood education on children's development. And then Sandy, Sandy Wong is also at Macquarie University where she's professor and she's a research fellow with Good Start Early Learning. And that's a large not-for-profit early childhood organization in Australia. And Sandy is particularly highly regarded for taking part in very collaborative research, um, not only with practitioners, but also academics, organizations, and governments, and really wanting to make, I think, a, a positive difference for quality early childhood practices um, in early childhood settings. So her current work investigates early childhood practices, workforce issues, educator well-being, and the history of early childhood internationally. So I'll hand over to both of you now, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. No de da tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda uh, and Olivera, for inviting us and for organizing this at a time that works well for us as well as, as for you. Um, we'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands at Charles Sturt University, the Wiradjuri Nation, and at Macquarie, the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture these lands since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present, and future. So thank you again for inviting us to present on this project, examining what it takes to be a high quality early childhood educator. We'd like to acknowledge the team whose names you can see there on the slide. Um, with special thanks to the research assistants who helped us with recruitment, with data management, with preliminary data analysis and throughout the study, their insights and broader contributions to what we discussed at our regular monthly meetings. We also acknowledge the ongoing support of our eight partner organizations uh, who've been with us since 2016. And this study was extended because of COVID um, to longer than it had originally been intended. Um, so our, our partner organizations include providers of early childhood education and care, unions and advocacy organizations, all of whom um, make an important contribution uh, to the field. And of course, we want to give special thanks to the educators who participated in the project. And without them, well, basically, we'd have nothing to tell you today. So, Sandy, if you could just go on to the next slide, this just gives you an overview of the presentation. Thank you, Sandy. Um, then Sandy and I will team tag uh, between these, these topics um, and as our specific you know, contributions and expertise uh, to the study um, is best uh, able to speak to. Um, at the end, we hope to have, as Oliveria has said, um, opportunities for questions and your comments. And just to give us an idea of your thoughts as we're going through, it would be helpful if you could write them in the chat and uh, they'll be monitored by Linda and Oliveira so that we um, can make sure that we respond to, to critical issues that come up from you. So Sandy, over to you for the first part on background and problem. Thanks, Linda. So what we thought we'd do is um, just start by giving you a little bit of a uh, background to the context and uh, what's happening in Australia um, at the moment. It's actually what gave rise to the study, but we we have a problem at the moment in early childhood education um, in uh, terms of a crisis in early in having early childhood educators, a shortage, but it's not actually a new problem. It's a problem that we've known about for quite a while, and it's what really was the impetus for this study. So we've got a real problem with turnover. So back in 2015, 2016, um, researchers like our colleagues, um, Sue Irvine and Karen Thorpe, um, identified that high turnover of early childhood teachers and educators at about 20 to 21%. And it's even higher in our regional and remote areas. So there's a problem with turnover, there's a problem with retention, 
And that means that, um, that therefore the experiences of the educators in the services is quite low. So the, the average tenure of, for qualified educators in their service is only about three and a half years. Um, and less than a third of educators actually have 10 or more years experience. So that means that um, the, yeah, the, the ex experience within an organisation is uh, within a service is not really there to support the newer teachers coming, newer teachers and educators coming through. And just a little bit of an um, explanation of that term, I'm going to use educators when we mean everybody. And if we specifically mean teachers, we'll say teachers. But the term educators, we are meaning to encompass educators of all different, the three different qualification levels that we have here, which is a Cert three qualification, a diploma, and then the, the three and four year degrees. Now, so that we've got all these problems, but COVID really just exacerbated that. And many services are having trouble filling um, permanent spaces, and indeed in getting casual staff when their staff are off sick to try and get somebody to come in and backfill those spaces. Um, there just aren't educators around to, to fill those spots. So we've got a problem with retention and retention. And unfortunately, it's not going to get any better because we've got this continual growth in early childhood. And that's going to be heightened by our new Labour government's pledge to greater access for early childhood education. Now, of course, we all want every child to have access to early childhood education. That's not the issue. It's just that we don't have enough teachers to provide that education. Even uh, pre-election, we um, there was a 19 percent estimated increase for the workforce um, and that the, we were, we're going to have a shortage of about 37,000 educators and uh, it, which includes about 7,000 teachers by 2024. And I actually think it's going to be much worse than that because these figures came out pre-COVID. Now, some people say, oh, well, really what all you need to do then is just get more, more students coming in to fill that gap. Well, and sadly, we've also got a problem in attracting educators into the field. And um, there's evidence of a declining supply of new educators and teachers. So enrolment in tertiary education is declining, not expanding as it needs to. Um, and um, not, not just that, but then they're not staying. So they're coming into the degree and then they're not completing. So we have an average of only 41% of students enrolled in any early childhood program completing their studies. It's better in the vet sector um, with certificate three and diploma educators. They finish about 60% of those finish, but for undergraduate initial teacher um, education programs, it's only about 51%. So um, we're not going to be able to meet that demand. So these are all problems that um, our colleague who was the original lead of the program, of the, the project, the Early Childhood Exemplary Educators at Work project, uh, which Linda now leads, but our uh, originally our uh, friend and colleague, Professor Fran Press, um, was the one who sort of con conceptual initially conceptualized the problem. And what she alerted us to is this issue of attracting, retaining and sustaining educators. So we, what do we mean by that? Well, sometimes we are attracting the wrong people into the, the sector because the sort of popular framing of early childhood education as being easy, it erodes our capacity to attract and retain the highly skilled educators that we need. People come into the profession thinking it's going to be easy, but those of us who work in the sector know it's anything but easy work. Um, and underpinning that is that kind of idea that uh, working with young children is easy work and it's natural for women and it's maternalistic discourses. Um, so they, they come in with this kind of idea that it's really easy and all I'm going to do all day is play with children. And of course, that's not what we do all day. We do play and it's important, but that's not what we do all day. And others come into the early childhood education thinking it's going to be like schooling. Um, and it's not. Early childhood education has its own unique, distinct pedagogy and specialisation. Like so, so if you're coming in thinking, oh, it's just, I'm going to be a teacher that's going to stand in front of a blackboard, if those things exist anymore, <laughs> they probably don't, um, you would be um, sadly mistaken. 
many come in because they love children and that's fabulous you know you don't want to come into this job if you don't like children but it's not enough okay coming in just thinking that you love children is just not enough so we're not attracting the right people in we're not retaining them um, we're not um, preparing them appropriately for the sector sometimes in our early childhood teacher courses there are minimal um, content around a, early years sometimes people have dismal prac placements and we lose them so we and then when they do come in we're losing them to the early the school sector um, and because pay and conditions are better and who wouldn't um, you know that we've got that to compete with and then when they're in we we have a problem with sustaining them it is highly complex work that early childhood educators do and it's getting more and more so you work with children with various qualifications various sorry with children of various ages and abilities educators have various uh, qualifications the families sometimes have very, um, are facing challenging situations there's onerous legislation it's like running a small business um, and you're not really getting the pay at least in not in Australia that uh, is commensurate to the work and we're not looking after the educators properly um, we just don't give them the resources in order to enable them to do their work so that's kind of the background to this study it's rewarding work um, and we know that high quality early childhood education does make a difference to children's learning and development. But sadly, the opposite is also true. Poor quality early childhood education is detrimental to children's learning and development, and especially to those that are experiencing marginalisation. Um, and they're doubly jeopardised um, when their early learning experience is also poor and perhaps um, their, their challenges in the home environment as well. And of course, we can't, it, it goes to be said, we can't go without saying that early childhood education is critical. It's a critical component of what is now being called the care economy. It's essential work that keeps the nation moving. Have you probably heard that during COVID? Um, but educate, but it's not that sort of magical thing that it doesn't just exist on its own. It's the educators that uh, provide this early learning care and education and it is the organizations with which um, early childhood educators work that enable and sustain that work so we really wanted to understand more about well, what is it that enables um, really high quality early learning um, for children that has the positive outcomes for 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 them in terms of their learning and development outcomes so that's what kind of underpinned this question the, the, the our study which and I'll just hand over to Linda for this section. Thanks Sandy. So if you just go on to the next slide what this illustrates the study design and the research questions. There we are. Okay so um, you can see here that there are four driving research questions and they fitted into the different phases of the study. Um, and what it also illustrates is the sequence. We started at the top with um, phase one and then progressed through to phase three. Um, what our, our use of a triangle um, fits with is the number of, uh, of participants. So we started with a very large number of participants in, who uh, we invited to complete the time use diary. Um, we then reduced, we, we selected from that a smaller number to participate in focus groups. And then we went down to the smaller number of case studies, 10 identified case studies. In some cases, the same centers had participated in all three, but we recruited at each stage of the study. Um, and um, the important part was that the study kind of got Although it got smaller in, in, in specific, it got larger in terms of complexity. But you'll learn about that as, as we go through. Um, so if we just move on to the next slide, we'll, I'll start moving through some of these different components. The first thing is, is to think about the term exemplary and how we then define that and how we ensure that the participants were from 
exemplary centers and therefore exemplary educators. So that, that sort of definition and rationale can be questioned, of course, but that was the way that we approached our recruitment. And we recruited at each stage of the study um, using information from the Australian Children's Education and Care Quality Authority or a CEQA. So they have, we have a regular quality assessment and rating system in Australia that's been in place since 2012. And all of these uh, ratings and assessments are recorded and stored by a CEQA uh, at a national level. They, all states and territories participate, all services under, for children under five participate if they need or want to be able to access government subsidies for their families to meet the cost of care. So it's pretty comprehensive. And that allowed us to then identify centers, not only that had achieved exceeding, so the ratings are meeting the national quality standard um, and then exceeding the national quality standard, or, and prior to that is working towards. Um, but we set a higher bar by saying that uh, in that, in achieving exceeding, we wanted them to, we wanted centers that had achieved exceeding on all of the seven underpinning quality areas. So just to give you the, um, the, the reality of that, currently there's just about a quarter of centers in Australia that have an exceeding NQS rating, but nowhere near all of those centers will have achieved exceeding on all quality areas, on all seven. They can be given an overall rating with a specific number of areas and specified areas that meet the quality uh, rating or quality area at exceeding. So we really are talking about quite a specialized and small sample, but we really felt that that was the only way then to find out what exemplary education, uh, early childhood education is like and what it takes to, to sustain it. Um, so Sandy, if you just go on to the next one, I'm gonna speak about the time story findings that uh, Linda's um, already mentioned was trialed and thought of uh, in, uh, at Waikato. Uh, and this looked specifically at one question, what is the work? And does, does it vary across qualification level and service types? So we just go on to how we developed this method. So time story methods um, are, um, are, are are traditionally from um, social sciences and quite complicated. They either involve um, somebody writing a, a handwritten diary of everything they, they've done during the day. Um, and often that's by recollection. At the end of the day, you think back and write it all out line by line, or you can be doing it as you go. Or it tends to involve somebody following along, observing someone and coding everything that they do in um, on a laptop or something like that. So either way, it's very intensive in terms of the demands on the educator or the demands on the researcher. So we worked with um, a specialist in Time Use Diary to develop this app, a smartphone app, that would allow people to complete a diary once at the end of, of a randomly identified hour. And we asked people to do that just twice a day. Typically, time use diaries gather three lots of information. What are people doing? Where are they doing it? And who are they doing it with? Or who's there while they're doing it? And those were the three parts of the time use diary that, uh, that we collected. But the most intensely, um, what, the most intense one in terms of research was developing the categories. What are educators doing? And we did this over quite a series of uh, pilot work and collaborative work and co-design work with experts in the field to identify these 10 categories that you can see on the screen. Each category then was broken down into subcategories, depending on the nature of the overall category. Some had a large number of subcategories, some only had a small number. And each of those categories and subclasses was then described um, with examples. So the people participating were given the kind of information that would help them use this time use diary that, um, smartphone app. The next slides then show you a little bit about what it looked like on the smartphone. So these are just quick images of what it looked like. And Sandy, you can just click through these. So um, you've got a, a main category, 
you choose a main category and then within that you choose the subcategory and then you fill in how long you were doing that for. So an intensive hour has to be broken down into a certain number of components um, and six minutes was the largest component that we could manage. Uh, we couldn't, or the smallest component that we could manage. We couldn't go any smaller than that and still fit it on the phone and still make it meaningful for people. But as you'll see later on, people do quite a lot uh, in a six minute period. Um, so they would fill that in for each activity and fill it in throughout uh, each of those, fill in all the six minute blocks, how long they were doing it. And then they could also, uh, and so the next question, if they were doing a secondary activity at the same time as the time period they had just filled in, and they would do this, the same, um, fill in the same information for that secondary activity. And that take, gave us a sense of multitasking, or when people are, are basically doing two activities within the same time period, either simultaneously or sequentially. Um, so if you just go on to the next slide, this is a sort of overview of a summary of, of what we found, um, that uh, it gave us evidence of the diversity of the work that people are doing um, across those 10 categories, the intensity of the work, how frequently they were multitasking, how long, how many tasks they did within an hour. And then we also looked at the qualification levels, and it was very clear that no matter what qualification, all of those 10 categories were being done <clears throat> by educators during the day. So the next slide is giving you um, the actual image of what the data looked like. And, and we'll, I'll talk you through this um, because it's very pretty, but it's also quite complicated. And hopefully you can see it fairly clearly. What we have here are the 10 categories and each one is color coded across a typical day. Um, this, this summary is based on the whole of the sample. So 321 educators who gave us information for uh, six, uh, 36 uh, thousand entries of six minutes. So a, a total of about 6,000 hours. Um, we analyzed it minute by minute with a time use diary expert analyst. And then she combined those into columns of 15 minutes. So when you look at this, you can pick a time of the day, say for example, 9.15 or something between 9.15 and 9.30, and just look from top to bottom and see on average overall, the amount of work that people were doing in each of those 10 categories. So this showed us that all 10 domains of work or 10 categories were completed and recorded across the day. Uh, for the whole, for the sample as a whole, with overall averages of um, break time about 12% and intentional teaching about 10% of people's time. And I'm just going from the top down. Um, being with children, actually, sorry, I'm, um, there's different colors. So the being with children is the large one, the green, um, that was about a third of people's day, the major part of, of the day. Uh, routine care, emotional support, being less family communication, interestingly, also still happening across the day. Organizing the room, planning and assessing and evaluating administration. So you can see the increases and the decreases of these different activities during the day. And this summary slide here includes people that worked in long daycare, which is why the time frame goes from seven in the morning till seven at night. Um, but also and preschool where the hours are, are shorter. So some of the patterns are, are reflective of the preschool participants. Um, but what this also shows us is that educators are doing a lot of different things every 15 minutes, in each 15 minutes. And by doing multiple things, there was this term that we started using of task rotation, of doing something for a fairly short period of time and moving on to another, and then moving on to another and another. If we move into um, slide 19, then we'll just look at some of the analyses that we conducted. So first of all, we looked at whether there were differences in the qualifications and whether work differed by qualification. Oops, Sandy, you got that? Yeah. Okay, so for some areas, intentional teaching, uh, staff development, uh, sorry, staff 
yeah, staff development time, like professional learning time, or providing emotional support, there was no difference between qualifications. As Sandy said, certificate level, diploma level, and degree qualified um, teachers. The differences where there were differences were primarily between degree qualified and certificate qualified. And what we found was that degree qualified staff spent more time in administrative activities, less time in just being with children, um, and less time in routine care. Certificate qualified staff spent more time in organizational tasks, that's you know, tidying the room, putting things, putting materials out, and less time planning and communicating with families. Interestingly, diploma qualified staff were really in the middle of both of those groups. So they were similar to certificate three staff in terms of being with children and routine care and administration, and similar to degree qualified staff in terms of that time spent planning, the time spent organizing um, the, the room, organizational tasks, and time spent communicating with families. Um, the next part of this slide will be about the task rotation. So this gives you a sense, and they've said, yeah, we've just got the graph there. This is the percentage of time the educators recorded their activities for each of the number of changes of activity. So when they move from one activity to the next. So you can see the majority of their uh, entries in the time use diary were for six minutes or 12 minutes. Very few of them had those longer periods of doing something for an extended period of time. Um, most entries were for that six or 12 minute, as I said. And the second thing we looked at was multitasking, which is the next part of the, the task. So what this is the green and the orange is showing you the number of times that educators filled in a secondary task. So even in those short periods of time, the majority um, were also um, suggesting that they did a secondary task as well. So overall, we had about 60% um, of entries also had a secondary task. Um, so just moving on to the next part. Um, so when we, oh, I won't go into that. I'm just saying that there was no significant differences on, on um, task rotation and multitasking for the three different qualification groups. So regardless of qualification, those graphs looked pretty much the same for the different participants. So now we'll look at the other thing that was unique about the time use diary. We were able to, at the end of the hour, ask educators how they felt about that previous hour and, and look at questions about whether that differed during the day. So these are the questions we were able to ask about feeling rushed, about satisfied, stressed, and whether multiple demands were made of them. And these were rated on a 10 point scale. But typically when you think about satisfaction, people rate that as a general impression of their work. Whereas this is something we could track hour by hour. We could also track it in relation to what people were doing. So this is quite, general and summary um, data that you're seeing here. This allows us the opportunity to do a lot more work in terms of trying to understand those variations. But in general, what you can see here is that satisfaction levels were typically high and stayed pretty high across the whole day. That's the black line at the top. So ratings of about seven um, or above on a 10 point scale. The yellow line is uh, the feelings of um, being having multiple things asked of them. And that's sort of in the mid range, more around four to five. Um, but again, you can see the pattern across the day is very closely matched to the other two lines, which are feelings of stress and feeling rushed. So it, it varied by the time of day, the ups and downs by the time of day. And we need to look more closely to see if that was tied to the sorts of things educators were actually doing in each of those time slots across the day. So um, I think I'm handing back to Sandy now, and she's going to take us on to the second phase of the study. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Linda. And what always amazes me with the time use diary is that um, it, 
many of you are probably thinking, yeah, well, we know that we know how we spend our day. But actually, there was very little evidence around how what educators are doing all day, every day in services. And now we've got the evidence and it, it is amazing evidence. Our time use diary um, person has never seen such um rotation um as so for example if i were to tell you what i did all day i'd be sitting down at the computer doing pretty much the same thing whereas educators are constantly changing um so the time use diary is giving us the evidence that says it's complex multitasking work so the next phase of the study then was to we we took the findings from the time use diary and we, we wanted to dig into this a little bit more deeply and so we did focus groups um, and the focus groups were with educators at each of the different uh, levels. So we had focus groups of centre directors, we had focus groups of the teachers um, and of the uh, diploma qualified educators and the um, certificate three edu qualified educators as well. And really the focus groups had two major um, purposes. One is to kind of interrogate what we said from the time found from the time use diary and did that make sense to them this kind of rapid changes in activity the multitasking and what we were a bit surprised about is these really positive um, ratings for work satisfaction but the other level is to also dig down into well what does it take to be an exemplary educator now we know what you do all day and we've got a bit of a sense of what that work is what does it take um, and so they were the two questions so what we um, found, and I meant those of you who are educators, this is probably going, yep, we know this, is that the work is really complex, it's very diverse, and it's also intense, but satisfying. And that's what makes educators go back to work every day, um, because they get personal fulfillment from it. So when we asked educators that the focus group participants around rapid change of, of the primary activity, so this kind of constant changing, the sense was that, well, yes, that's that's what we do, but we have to prioritise. We're always thinking what needs to be done next. What should I do first and second? Um, we also talked about multitasking. That's doing two things at the same time. Um, and educators told us, yeah, that's that reflects what we do. We're never still. We're always, you know, we're doing at least one thing, usually two things at the same time. Um, but then there was this kind of, yes, we really enjoy our work. Um, and mostly they told us this because they oh, the, the, actually they're findings from a different study. I won't go into those ones there, um, but that they, they, they really were positive around their work satisfaction. Um, so um, what were the, some of the things that impacted on this? They told us that it was about the age of the children. Um, the nature of the work was really, a, it's literally about doing this constant, constant scanning, constant changing. It's just what you do as an early childhood educator. But also there are many interruptions in that work. Um, you might be sat with a group of a small group of children doing a mass activity, but they are always also thinking about the other three children over here who are playing in the sandpit. So there's lots of things that are going on, lots of interruptions, um, constantly people coming into the service and um, demanding many things of you, families wanting to know, um, you know, about their child, where their sock is, um, and to tell you they're going on holiday next week. So lots of interruptions to the work. But people love their work. Um, they love their work. These were in high quality services. They love their work environment. They love the flexibility of their work. Um, and they were really, um, they wanted to stay in their job because of the philosophy. So what are some of the factors then that support that? This idea that you can um, make, it, it, early childhood education is quite autonomous. You, you don't have a, a curriculum that tells you what you have to do every single day. A educators are able to prioritise and to, to decide what their day is going to be like based on the needs of the children and the interests of the children. Things like teamwork, leadership, the, the communication between um, educators, teams that have been together for a, a long time have that kind of seamless communication where all they need to do is kind of look at the other educator, nod their head or just do a, li a little head shake like that. And they can really communicate. Everybody knows they're on the same page. They know what they're doing. 
of course, there's that kind of passion that we talk about as being an early childhood educator, but also an advocacy arm for that, that, that they really um, advocating for the rights of children, um, the ability to critically reflect, reflect on what they're doing having men opportunities for mentoring and coaching and for other professional development but particularly professional development that's geared to what they wanted um, and there were the conditions that enabled that so things like having above ratio so more educators than are actually legally required um, staff models that enable um, a, a spread of qualifications having non-contact programming time was critical uh, these are all the kinds of things that sustain the early um, the educators in these high quality services as well as having professional networks and relationships outside of the service so you might think well are these are these some of the factors that are ringing true for you that makes you maybe you hunting out a service that it that provides you with these kind of um, facilities and opportunities so that was the focus group and um as i said that was to help us to understand the 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 time use diary, but also to start to think about well, what is it that enables these um, the, the, the exemplary practice. The third stage of the fuzz, third phase of the study was a case study. And this was where we really got in. We were absolutely privileged as um, researchers to be able to go into these high quality services and really spend some time with the educators to find out well, what is it about this place that makes it special? Um, so we did 12 case studies and we um, had two visits. The first visit was a three was a, about a three day visit or up to three days that did get a little bit changed during COVID. We had to do some some things via um, online. But during that first visit, we got to know the educators. We um, uh, implemented a particular survey that Linda's going to talk to you about. We conducted interviews with the educators and their central directors. We discussed things. We just had chats with them. We collected um, artifacts. And by that, I mean, you know, maybe it was the picture of the roster or how they'd set up their staff room. And we asked uh, educators to collect some examples of things that they were really, um, they thought uh, reflected their, their practice. And just to be clear, what we were talk what we're talking about in terms of exemplary practice is not something whiz bang. It is what educators do every day. It's the high quality learning environments that they are providing for children every single day. That second visit was a longer visit, um, and we we kind of chatted back about well, this is what I was thinking from the previous day. We conducted more interviews and then we did this thing called shadowing where we followed educators as they went about their day. Um, and um, we talked to them around what we saw and asked, well, can you explain why that is? Why did you set the sandpit up in that way? Why, why did you um, put the easel in that particular corner? What, what was it that made you do that? So that we could understand the intentionality behind what the educators were doing. We, of course, just kept taking lots of observations, kept collecting more artifacts and documents. And one of the really interesting things we did is when we saw exemplary practice, we documented it, we wrote it down. And then with the educators, we co-constructed um, a, a, the, what the, uh, the practice looked like. And here's an example of what an example of exemplary practice. Now, if you read this, it is just what educators do every day, but it's also extraordinary. It is exemplary practice. It's that kind of constantly um, shifting from playing and extending conversations and affirming children. There would be nothing here that you would go, oh, well, um, that's that's we can't possibly do that. This is exemplary practice. This is what educators in high quality services are doing every day of the week. Um, Linda's just going to talk to you about the findings from the sequel study now. Linda. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting that we were able to, some of the questions that we had um, about the supports for exemplary practice had, had already been studied by a group of researchers in America, and we collaborated with them to use and adapt this survey that they had used um, in, in mostly in America. So we adapted it, we tested it for Australians, um, 
educators, and Sandy had a lot to do with, with that stage of the work. Um, so SQL is an online survey, and we use this in the, in the case studies with all the staff in the case studies, not just the ones that were identified for shadowing. Um, and what SQL did really, in a way, was, was pick up a lot of the themes that were raised in the focus groups that they were already there in, in the SQL questionnaire so that they could be explored numerically and also through further comments in the case study um, sites. Um, so educators completed the survey during that, those first visits and uh, we provided um, backfill so that they could um, be paid to spend that time uh, to do that. So the next slide has got uh, the scores for these different groupings um, of what contributed. And some of these things are exactly the same headings as Sandy just showed you on the outline of what came out of the focus groups around leadership, um, uh, well-being, job crafting, etc. So the score was a maximum of six. And you can see, not surprisingly, perhaps, for this sample of exemplary services, the ratings averaged really quite high. They were either five or or, or above, or if below, only just below. Um, the top of the slide, which seems to have been cut off, is um, because I probably accidentally moved it, Sandy. <laughs> is uh, the first column is the average across the whole sample. The second two lines are the fact that we were able to do this survey with participants before um, COVID hit Australia. Then we had a long gap, and when we went back, we did it with the other half of, of the case study sites. And interestingly, the scores had improved um, pre-COVID to post-COVID, and that in itself is a, an interesting finding. But what I've showed in the middle column there, where there's three numbers in a row, is the distinct is the difference between qualification levels. And just like the time use diary that we found. Uh, the diploma qualified staff were the ones that were doing what teachers and certificate staff were doing. They were they were really doing everything. Um, they are the ones that primarily had the lower scores. So it's interesting to think about that and what it is that we're asking of people with diploma qualified um, staff and how they are supported. Because clearly they are giving slightly lower ratings of or their feelings of support. Um, Sandy, if you just go on to the next one, I think these are just some of the quotes that came up in the survey of what people said about aspects of these different components of teaching supports um, and job crafting. Um, and the next one is um, two other quotes there about leadership and adult well being. So, very important aspects. Leadership came up very, very strongly as being what was influencing so much of the other areas of, um, of educators' work and how they rated their work. So Sandy is now going to bring together all of these case study findings into um, a final summary. Um, and I'll hand back to you, Sandy, thanks. Thanks, Linda. What I should have said is the case study, that, um, we had a focus on um, three educators per service, one at each qualification level. Um, but as Linda said, the sequel went to everybody, but we were particularly focusing on, in the case study, on um, an educator with a cert, cert three qualification diploma and teacher qualification in each of the services that had been identified by their centre director as being, you know, an exemplary educator. And it was interesting because when we started, they were a little bit um, bashful about, about that. Oh, I don't know why I was chosen as exemplary. But um, we working with them um, and reflecting back to them, what amazing things that we were seeing that they were doing. Um, I think it built up a really beautiful relationship between the, the um, participants in the case study because we did see some extraordinary everyday practices in these high quality services. So when we bring it all together, um, what, what sort of the overall findings from this is from the, faith, the, the, the whole case study. And um, so one of our participants said, oh, it's the pedagogy of everything. It's 
everything. It's not just the intentional teaching with the children, but the pedagogy of the relationships with families, of relationships with one another within the context of the, the larger work environment. These are services that often went above and beyond um, what was required. They had really intentional practices, but this was consistent um, across all educators. But the findings that I'm going to share with you in a moment, it's important to say, like, we didn't find one magic cookie. You, it's not like if you all did this, it would work because it's not a one size fits all. What's possible in one site is not possible in another. For example, we had services that didn't have outdoor environments. They had particular, um, but they had they had uh, managed their indoor environment in a way that really provided the children with high quality learning. So it's not it's not we're not saying that everybody has to do the same thing, um, but there are some learnings that we um, got from the the case study. And the first is, of course, that there needs to be these extrinsic factors. There needs to be things on the outside in the social, political context. And one of those is, of course, the availability of educators. This has affected um, the ability of all services to operate in high ways. There's also that need for the organisational support, whether that be um, a, the owner of a service or the board of the service. They all have to provide the resources for the educators to do the work that they need to do. There has to be good governance um, uh, arrangements. There have to be working conditions that are um, supporting educators, flexible arrangements of, of, of for their work and so on. So things like when the centre director knows that the, the, um, the educator's child is going to be in the school play, they, get, they do some flexible work around so that the, the educator can go and see their child in the school play. So that kind of flexibility. Um, having a shared vision and purpose. Um, and really, it was a particular kind of uh, philosophies, like having an ethic of care, being socially just, um, those kind or or having a particular pedagogical approach that kind of tied things together. And in order for that to happen, there was purposeful recruitment and policies. So people were really trying to target particular people to come and work in their organisation or people with um, particular views on the child, for example. It needs leadership. Absolutely critical that there are, are leaders um, who are compassionate who are fair, who are flexible, but at the same time have high expectations of educators. So they, they're all those good things, but they also expect really high, um, they have high expectations of the educators. As well as leadership, the teams that work together so that there is trust and respect, there's a cohesion, there's clear communication. They're the kinds of things amongst a team that support this high quality work. work. The kind of what Linda was talking about in that kind of everybody's got a clear role, but there's a bit of flexibility amongst what everybody does. And then, of course, there are individual factors around the educators. So their skills, their knowledge, their dispositions, um, how articulate they were in communicating um, what they were doing and why they were doing it um, and being present with with the children. That was another important point. And of course, having physical spaces that enable this to happen, having a staff room where educators can actually rest and recuperate after a morning's work, um, having resources um, and so on that are available to support them in that work. So these are the kind of things that enable exemplary practice to happen. It's not all about the educators. It's not all about the organisation. It's at every single level. OK, so we know that. So what do we need? Going back to that first question, if we want to sustain educators in the work um, going forward, what do we need to do? Well, we actually need to prepare educators better. Um, and that's our job as tertiary educators. We do need to help them to understand the work so that they have much more realistic expectations. Um, I think we also need to focus on self-care. Um, and uh, in our education preparation courses and help people to understand how to look after themselves because there is an individual educator responsibility um, care for grounding care not just for the children not just for your ed for your colleagues not just for the families but also for yourself because unless you look after yourself you can't do this work 
educators, um, employers have to provide those safe workplaces that, um, and that means also making sure that they're supporting collegiality um, and, and cohesiveness of a team, creating this um, clear articulated vision so that everybody can share in it together. Um, they have the same philosophy because they work and everybody working. Um, so a collective and a clearly articulated statement of the collective perspective of an ethic of care for educators included, and one that's grounded in socially inclusive practice. Having those organizational contexts and supports um, the, the, and the organizational context, which really prioritizes educators and provides them with those resources. Collegial and mutually respectful relationships and safe and supportive organizational climates. That's essential for um, going forward. So there are a whole lot of things that um, need to be done at the individual level, at the organizational level, um, but also we need to advocate for social change at the sort of macro level, um, at the social context level. And that means um, changing policies uh, and creating policies, uh, creating and changing policies that enable this work to happen. And we've got some work underway within Australia that um, around workforce strategies and so on that are trying to do that. So it's, it's advocacy that leads to the policies that guide the work and conditions, both at that sort of local level, at the national level and the international level as well. The findings from our study, the overall findings are going to be shared in a report, hopefully by the end of this year, if not early next year, it's called the Shining a Light on Early Childhood Educators Work um, Project uh, Report, and um, that will be available on our website shortly. Um, I think that kind of brings us close to the end of our presentation. I'm just cognizant that we have kind of kind of not really left enough time for questions and comments, but um, Linda and I are available. That's our email address there, um, addresses. So you're very happy to uh, get in contact with us. I think there might be, uh, Olivera, are there some questions in the chat that we need to address? Thank you so, uh, so much, Alinda and Sandy. It was really amazing to hear about this research and actually very complex, I would say, research. And I'm pretty sure that many people would like to, to actually unpack so many aspects of your research. Um, that's why we actually got one uh, question. And I actually kind of think, uh, given the time, we can maybe address this question and maybe open up space for anybody who would like to uh, kind of directly ask the question. So the question in the chat bo uh, box was, from Sandra Collins. Thank you so much, Sandra. And the, the question was, would you, Sandra, like to read the question or you would like me to read it? Uh, yeah, I can, I, I'll, I'll start. And, um, oh, sorry, does Sandra, did you want to raise it yourself? No, no, I'm happy for you just to respond. Thank you. Okay, so the question, first of all, two parts to the question. And was the amount of time spent in intentional teaching a surprise? And that's obviously the report from the Time Use Diary, which is the average across a whole day and, and across all of the data that we got. It definitely was a surprise every time we presented it. And thank you for raising it because it, it certainly comes up a lot. People would have liked it to be more, um, but it is what it is. Um, and I think. Also, you know, it's something that the definitions of intentional teaching will have changed from when we first developed our categories quite some time ago. Um, but in terms of the second half of your question, did we see intentional teaching or sustained shared thinking episodes between educators and children? And how important was that aspect? I'll, I mean, I certainly can say from the case study observations that I did, that it was happening all the time. And we asked questions afterwards in terms of, of people's views about intentional teaching and being with children, because the other one was, well, if you're being with children, isn't that being intentional with the children? So Sandy, I'll, I'll hand it over to you just to fill in a yeah. bit more about that. So the reason we had those two categories, two domains is because we did a pilot study way back and there was a clear diff difference between 
when an educator might be um, in a in a outdoor environment for example and say and they were using the words I was scanning the environment or I was I was sitting listening to the children and then there was a very different kind of well I intentionally set up this learning environment so when we when we designed the the time use diary they they were distinct categories and that's what the educators wanted in the pilot study they wanted to be able to differentiate those two things as Linda said I think as time has gone on understanding around what intentionality means rather than intentional teaching is uh, has changed um but I think it's also important not to downplay the being with children um because being with children is really important <laughs> and what we have in those in that domain is sitting is listening to children engaging with children so this is not it's not something that is you know you're just sort of sitting there and and not doing anything it's actually active being active with the children so it always raises issues this kind of differentiation <laughs> yeah thank you thank you i'm just thinking would anybody like to maybe ask one last question i'm aware of the time it's almost like time up but maybe one more if anybody would like to share or comment on ask anything i might finish if, if nobody's got a question i might actually sort of say one of the things about this study is there's a lot of things here that everybody kind of goes oh yeah i know that i know that but what we didn't have at the beginning of this study is the evidence we didn't have the evidence around what educators did all day. We didn't have the edu the evidence of what it is to support this kind of work. Um, and that's what this study contributes. It's the evidence behind what we probably already knew. Everybody kind of knows leadership's important. Everybody kind of knows the collegiality is important. But now we've got some evidence around that, that these things are absolutely critical if we want to provide um, high quality early learning but that also that educators are sustained in that work. Mm. Um, and, and so we've just contributed. You know, I would be surprised if anybody look, looked at our results and went, oh, that doesn't make sense to me. That's not my experience. Um, but it, and yeah, so. Mm -hmm. On that note, maybe uh, Sandy, there is a, a like, question by Kiri, and thank you so much, Kiri, for asking that because it's kind of policy. You actually mentioned it's kind of not just individual changes, also organizational change and kind mm -hmm. of governmental, kind of on the macro level change. So, yeah. what specific policy changes would you advocate for that might support exemplary early childhood organizations and teachers? Maybe that is the kind of question to bring. Um, a bit more kind of policy context in, in place. Mm. I think we've we've probably all got our own little we're our own favorites, but for me that the, it's I believe that early childhood educators know what to do and know how to do it, but they don't necessarily have the resources to enable them to do that work. Uh, and by resources I mean the working conditions um, and the, the the context that enables that work to happen. And um, so anything that what I would recommend is things that enable the conditions so of course pay and conditions are really critical to that um, but it's also things um, like it critical reflection is a corner is a key part of um, high quality practice and if I've never done a study where educators haven't told me that they they need more time more time and we cannot give you more time because there is only a certain number of hours in the day but what we can do is change the working conditions to enable that to happen. So at the moment in, in Australia, we have um, educators get two hours a week to do their programming. I think we need much more than that to enable um, high quality programs. So things like conditions, things like ratios. Um, I, I And this this in the services that we visited, they tended to be above ratio. So I think that's what creates the conditions. So paying conditions are paying conditions are absolutely critical. Um, of course, professional de development and all of those things are absolutely critical. Um, but it's for me, it's about creating the conditions and, and, and the things. If I had a magic wand, the things I would change would be 
um, ratios and programming time. <laughs> Linda might have a different view. <laughs> Well, I, I agree completely with what you're saying, Sandy. I mean, but also, you know, a lot of the things that we've found about what contributes to high quality practices and learning environments is just can't necessarily be legislated. Um, but if you think about, because, you know, they depend on the, the providers and the kind of organization that provides it. Um, not all of our case studies were not-for-profits, but most of them were. And, um, you know, clearly in our sector, when we've got these national quality ratings, we can see that the not-for-profits are typically rated lower uh, as a group, as a whole. Their, their ratings tend to be lower than the uh, not-for-profits are. I think yeah. it's, it's not as easy to say for-profits bad, not-for-profits good. It's no, 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 not, not at all. Yeah, and, no. and I know Linda doesn't mean that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, there are some absolutely excellent high quality for-profit services and some really not so good not-for-profit services yeah. um so but you know when you are making when when you're when your imperative is to make money for shareholders i think there is a problem there considering that you know most of that money comes from taxpayers anyway mm. um yeah <laughs> And I'm actually seeing people nodding. Uh, it quite resonates with, uh, with a lot of other yeah. contexts, including New Zealand. Um, mm -hmm. I'm aware of the time, and we are slightly uh, taking longer than than actually. But you are getting a lot of messages, people thanking you really and Thank appreciating you. your work. And I'm pretty sure when we make this link uh, available, people would actually like to go over again and might actually contact you. But thank you so much for uh, delivering this amazing presentation, such a complex research uncovering a lot of actually kind of intense parts of the work, everyday life and practices of, of teachers and actually showing really that complexity in a, such a sophisticated way and capturing that it's it's really amazing. Thank you so, so much. And thank you all, uh, thank uh, all people to joining us. We are actually just getting a lot of like uh, messages and I, I'm sorry, I can't read them all, but it is all about actually <laughs> thanking you about the quality of your research. And I will just actually close us off with um, Karakia before we leave. Um, Noreira tenakoto tenakoto katoa. Kia fakairia te tapu, kia vatea aiteara, kia turu ki fakatahai, kia tuki fakatahai, humie huie tai kie. Thank you so much um, uh, all for joining us and please get in touch. We will make this uh, recording available so that you can actually watch again and uh, engage in further those, uh, discussions.